Hello everyone, welcome to Q&A time. And I always look forward to this, and the reason I do is because you send your questions. I get to then look at them, and then what I do is I try and group them a little bit. And one of the questions that was asked of me is very, very intriguing. And I guess in a way, I'd like to put it in a couple of different ways. Consider people coming up to Jesus and saying, teach us how to pray. So hold that thought. And then I'd like you to think about the Pharisee and the publican slash tax collector in the parable uh, where it says that the tax collector is beating his breast and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, which, by the way, is the basis for what's commonly called the Jesus Prayer, which I hope that all of you know about. If you don't, maybe another day I'll talk about different kinds of prayers rather than praying. And what it was that the Pharisee said. It says there that after he boasted, kind of let everybody know, uh, presumably he was praying, but he was catching God up and everything that God had missed out on. And he prayed to himself, it says. And then, I want you to think about the number of times that you have said, although you're a little more polite than this, hello, is there anybody up there? <laughs> I don't think God hears my prayer. So, let's look carefully at all of that, because one of the questions that I've been asked over my uh, uh, 40... How many years have I been ordained? Let's see, I was ordained in 1974, you do the math. But in all those years of ordination, uh, after everybody is, has figured out what's the gospel side, what's the epistle side, what color do we wear, are they uh, holding this the right way, or doing this the right way, um, we get down to the basics. And some of the reasons that I teach liturgy is if I can get people to have answers to all those questions, then we can get down to what liturgy is all about. Uh, you know that I'm a little bit particular. I never call liturgy this the service, <laughs> uh, because uh, service is what we do. Uh, it's, um, it's how we help other people. And praying, according to the Eucharistic prayer, um, book on prayer, here we offer and present to Lord ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. And then we go on to talk about this, our bounden duty and service. Now, it's not talking about the Eucharist here, folks, nor is it talking about baptism. It's talking about what we do as a response to an encounter with Jesus. Or, as you've heard me say, what I oftentimes will have in bulletins, the liturgy is over, your service begins. Well, that's pretty much what happens. Go out into the world. Get busy. And so, in prayer, we come before the throne of grace. Now, oftentimes, people have a good excuse for not praying. Sadly, most of the reasons exist between uh, their two ears. And it's kind of a disconnect between the head, the heart, and the hands, which is our usual way of looking at prayer, head, heart, and hands. And sometimes living up between our earlobes happens to be all the reasons why we don't do something. Oftentimes it begins with something like, I don't feel like fill in the blank. Well, I don't know how many things you have to do per day that you don't feel like doing. <laughs> But if we only did what we felt like doing, that's what life would be like for all of us. And praying is one of those things that's non-negotiable. But the question people have is, am I praying the right way? Maybe because I'm not doing it the correct way, God's not listening to me intentionally because he doesn't like the way I'm praying. Well, certainly one of the things that troubles me about the age in which we live is how rude people have become. You know, the rudeness that is shown, the lack of respect that is shown to parents by their children or 
grandchildren to their parents, I mean, to the grandparents, uh, for example, or um, in stores, rudeness. We say things in stores that, my word, we'd never say to another person, would we? Or maybe we would. But the age in which we live, we get to see all of that on TV, and it teaches us, doesn't it? All the rude things that happen on TV and in the movies, and we laugh about it because we think it's funny. You know how many people are hurt by those rude things? And now, I think without going into detail, you recognize in the society in which we live, uh, there's not always a respect for the office that somebody holds, whatever it may be. Because it used to be that we respected the office of somebody even when we weren't too thrilled with them. But today we put the onus on the people who hold the office and we say, pretty much, you have to earn my, trust, my respect. I'm not going to respect you until you earn it. And children oftentimes do that with their parents. I don't understand it, but as you know, part of my job is just reporting the news. I do a lot of uh, listening and watching. And I, in my counseling, get to hear things that parents become really upset about that their children say to them. Or co-workers or others. The problem is they oftentimes are unwilling to say it with those people present. Partly, I guess, because if all the truths are out there, it might alter the allegations. I don't know. There's different reasons, right? Uh, for example, I can think of some leaders in the church. Uh, if I'm unwilling to sit down and have a talk with them, in one sense, um, I have no business calling other people on the phone and complaining about them because I haven't been honest enough to have a conversation. But we have to understand that honesty is a, not just feelings. If somebody's going to be honest with you and, and it's just feelings, well, um, they need to go a little deeper than that. And that's about prayer, so let's look at it. They came to Jesus and they said, teach us how to pray. Jesus responded by saying, Glad you asked the question. I'm going to teach you a prayer, and you need to say it seven times a day, and then you'll be praying, and then I'll start listening to you. They said, teach us how to pray. Have you ever taken the Lord's Prayer and divided it up to see what types of prayer are there? Because you know there's at least five different types of prayer. There's more, actually, but people sometimes do it just because they call it the hand prayer. They just Look at petition, intercession, thanksgiving, um, whatever the different parts that you want to add to that. You know, intercession is always a significant part. Penance, always sorry for what we do. There's different types of prayer. And of course, then there's liturgical prayer, and that's different from private prayer. So, that doesn't mean that Jesus was teaching us a prayer to memorize, although we better, I think. But he was telling us the different types of prayer and how we're supposed to approach it. For example, we begin not by saying, hey, you, do you realize today how much rudeness there is in the way in which people address other people? Hey, hey, you, is it? It's just rude, folks. And I know you you don't do that. I don't mean to say that anybody I know does that. But I mean, I listen and I hear the way communications take place. And just as we're taught good table manners, so people don't hold their forks like this, or their uh, knives like this, and eat like that. So it is that we have other manners that we have to learn, like how to talk on the phone, uh, how to be able to communicate with one another. So praying is also a part of respectful communication. Okay, I get it. You've been angry with God. You shouted. You screamed at him. That's not what I'm talking about. He accepts your feelings, even though your feelings may not be accurate. It's okay. You just need to have a good and honest relationship with Jesus. Uh, but, at the same time, it's not a formula. What happens here is, it's a matter of the heart. The, when we pray incorrectly, if there's such a thing, it, it's um, when we pray in ways that are not helpful, like being penitent. It goes like this. I don't know if you're up there, but uh, you're probably not, so you'll listen to my prayers anyway. But I, I, 
I don't get any of this. Okay. Well, uh, it would be nice to begin by saying something like, Dear Lord, Almighty and Everlasting God. You know, in our tradition, we use the Trinity in our prayers. We pray to the Father, through the Son, and in the power or in the unity of the Holy Spirit. It's Trinitarian, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, not all of our prayers are like that. And it's okay. That's not disrespectful. Maybe we're just looking at Jesus and we, we're worried about how we construct our prayer. Don't worry about how you construct your prayer. Now, somebody asked me the question uh, because I had said that it's possible for prayer to express heresy. And of course it is. Many of the heresies that we've had throughout the course of history have incorporated those heresies into the prayers. And they usually involve such things as uh, the, the, the two natures, the uh, human and divine natures of Jesus, or the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, other heresies get expressed in our prayers. The problem is we don't write those prayers down and impose them on other people. <clears throat> so even though you and I probably have prayed some prayers that were impertinent or uh, espouse some kind of heresy. Jesus, and I know this is a shock, so hold on to your seats. English is not the only language that God speaks. That being said, there are certain words that we use in English that are really a little bit odd, but Jesus looks at our heart. It's kind of like me. You know, I've studied, I think, I don't know, maybe five languages. And there are times when I can't recall a word, a vocabulary word. But in here, I'm already speaking it, but it's taking a long time to come out here. So uh, we begin the Mass, don't we? Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom you say, right, no secrets are hidden. Beautiful prayer, by the way. It's unique to our tradition, frankly. It comes out of a usage uh, that was um, prominent in the English church long before the consolidation of some of the liturgies that came out of Rome. And it's a very, very precious prayer. Now that beautiful prayer means that God already knows everything, but he's waiting for us to tell him. You look like that in some relationships. You know what's wrong with your child. You know what's going on with them. But you know for their own good they better tell you. So you can see their body language. So you can um, get some sort of articulation from them. I was talking with a former parishioner of mine from, oh, I don't know, 40 years ago, I guess, the other day. And um, her son, who's now in his 40s, uh, came into the conversation. He was one of my older boys. And I remember when he was a little boy, um, he told his mommy on the way to Mass, he said, you know, I can't wait to get to the church because I, I want to see the creatures. He had just seen a movie. His mother was taken aback. She says, uh, what creatures are you talking about, son? He said, oh, you know, you heard Father. He says it every Sunday that I'm there. These creatures of bread and wine. Well, that's cute, isn't it? I mean, you and I get it. it. It requires a little explanation. But it doesn't mean he was off target. It just meant that that was not yet a part of his theological understanding. So that means that what comes with prayer, the right way to pray is with humility. That's what Jesus is addressing, isn't he? In the parable of the Pharisee and the publican or the tax collector is the spirit of humility because if the Pharisee was praying to himself he would just try and impress everybody around him and he perhaps wanted everybody to know that he had uh, God on on hand right there to point out to God how wonderful he was or some of you have heard me say there are a lot of people that rewrote a, a, a hymn that I I learned in Swedish, actually. I don't know all the English words for it, but 
I learned the hymn in Swedish because it was a, a well-known, the tune was a well-known club song, uh, folk song sung by the Swedes, but the words that were eventually written uh, were How Great Thou Art. And I contended that when we're at our worst, uh, we're saying how great I art. And so in praying, when we determine how great he is and how we aren't, we hang out with him more so that we can become more like him. Now, how do you do that? How do you hang out with Jesus? How do you spend more time with him? Well, that's certainly what prayer is about. It doesn't have to be formal. It could be any variety of places. But every now and then, now, if you've never done this, turn off, tune back in in three minutes. So here it goes. You don't have to pray out loud for it to be a legitimate prayer. Some people just don't like sitting around in a circle uh, in a Bible study or prayer group or something, and the expectation is that person number one has prayed out loud, now it's person number two's turn. If person number two doesn't have anything to say, there must be something defective. Nobody should be forced to have to pray out loud. Why? Well, some days we're afraid of what might come out. <laughs> Other days it's because we just feel so dried up. That's called aridity in ascetical theology, the study of prayer. Aridity. We feel really dry. We don't have anything to say. Now, I need to ask you this. Is a private, silent prayer as legitimate as a prayer that's prayed out loud? Well, I think so. Or else people who have lost the ability to speak are in real trouble, aren't they? I used to visit a man who had had such a severe stroke that the only way he could communicate was with a new technological device because the only thing that moved in his body were his eyebrows, his eyes. And he communicated with me by going A, B, C, D. And then it would go on to a device and I could spin it around and look at it. I had a priest who was dying of ALS and eventually did. And I saved up my money and I went out and bought a device for him so that he could uh, type a message because it was still typed. And then once he typed it up on his device, he would push a button and then there would be a voice telling me everything that he wanted to tell me that day. Although one day, he was a funny man, one day he actually decided to use a, a woman's voice from the South. And just watching him laugh and laugh and chuckle, and I listened carefully to that, was great fun. You see, praying is fun. Communicating can be fun. Now, next point. Let's look at the next point here. Don't work on the words, please. If somebody asks you to pray, don't say I'm inadequate because I'm not a good speaker. You don't have to be a good speaker to be a good prayer. In fact, if you look carefully at the Bible, I want you to see how many times healings took place where nothing was said. So you don't have to impress other people. No, I'm, I don't want you to think what I'm saying here is something other than what I mean. So let's go through that again. I don't want you ever to think that the quality of your words has something to do with the quality of your prayer. Now, I believe the spoken word has power. There's no question in my mind about that. But if you're a shy person, an introverted person, a person of few words, nobody should demand that you pray out loud. In fact, sometimes for humility's sake, Especially if we find that we're trying to say prayers that will impress somebody else. So it's your turn to pray if you're in such a setting. You may just say, let us pray in silence. Why are people afraid of silence? Today you can almost 
hardly ever talk to anybody. I think what's happened is, maybe I'm the only one, but when I go repair something with super glue, the only thing that really sticks together are my fingers. Now, I mean, the other thing's sitting there laughing at me because I wasn't able to fix it, but my fingers are stuck together. And I think some people put super glue on their cell phones. And they're kind of attached to them or to their devices or whatever that may be, or to, I don't know, fill in the blank. There's other things. I mean, I'm picking on people who, who use their devices. I mean, it's just I wasn't brought up with it because uh, of my age. You know, just like, don't be upset with me that I can't work computers very well. I didn't know what a computer was until I was uh, in graduate school. So considering all of the changes in communication, the one thing that hasn't changed though is prayer. How we do it, I guess, today has uh, changed with some of the technology. I couldn't have done this with you years ago. But prayer is prayer. And I think you know that I think one of the best books on the subject is written by the sixth bishop of Quincy, I'm the eighth, who was sometime dean of Neshoba House, may he rest in peace, Bishop Donald J. Parsons, who wrote a book called Lifetime Road to God. And I sincerely hope that all of you have that book. If you don't, you can order it. It'll sound like a commercial, but you have to understand my wife and I actually um, purchased the company that we owned, uh, the Parish Press, ostensibly because we wanted to have the rights to his books <laughs> so that we could keep on republishing them. The rest of it just came along, which was great. But we wanted to be able to get more people reading Bishop Parsons' books. And there are a number of articles, and I have in my files what was willed to me by him and his family that I want to work on someday. But the three books that he wrote that are out there are absolutely remarkable. And they help us with all these things from beating ourselves up over the way we pray or the different types of prayer. And even when we don't feel like praying, don't beat yourself up when you don't feel like praying. I'm not telling you in what I said earlier that we don't have those feelings. It's just that we can't live on the basis of our feelings. I guess people only went to work when they felt like going to work. Well, imagine what that would be like. Or if uh, a parent only felt like taking care of their child when the child started crying, uh, that might be difficult. Or if the parent only showed any enthusiasm for what's going on in the child's life when the child says something like, you know, this is the sixth concert of mine that you haven't come to. The parent said, eh, you know what, I just didn't really feel like doing that. Well, I mean, obviously there's going to be conflict, so we can't live our lives on the basis of doing what we do just when we feel like it. Sometimes growing up means having to do things because we promised we would. Or because God has asked us to do that as a new race to pray. But do keep in mind that in prayer, God does not ask us to do things that are out of character with him. You do know that, right? God does not tell us to do things in prayer that are uncharacteristic for him. Or put it another way, God never contradicts himself. Look in the scriptures, he never contradicts himself. So when I pray and I pray and I pray and I don't feel like God's listening to me, that must mean, therefore, he's not because that's how I feel. Wrong. See, part of spending time with somebody is to become more like them. And the more you pray, even though you may not feel like you're getting answers, you're being shaped. You're being conformed more to his likeness. In some instances, you're even having your mind changed. Because you go to God with your mind already made up, or how dare they, or you see what they're doing, and on and on and on. And everybody feels this, and you know, all those things we go to God with, which, by the way, we should. Gotta have honesty with God. I mean, it's a little bit like in this world, people should have more filters when it comes to communicating with people, but uh, they don't have to have all those filters when they pray. Because God already knows, so why not be honest with him? And the reason I put it that way to you is because never be surprised when the people you love who are praying more become more loving. 
more understanding, more compassionate, and more forgiving. You are, your life, is supposed to be a byproduct, so to speak, of a relationship with Jesus through prayer. That's right. That's right. Your life is a reflection of what you believe. Or, as one of the, well, I can't remember his undergraduate graduate school in psychology, but uh, one of the things, he, it was graduate, he would say to us, in, in what you're doing, he would say, always ask yourself the question daily, am I who I represent myself to be? Am I who I represent myself to be? So, if you bill yourself as a Christian, you shouldn't be surprised when somebody expects you to act like one. Well, that's a tough one for me, because, you know, I'm not supposed to get angry or upset or frustrated. I'm supposed to be, you know, kind of here all the time. And a great deal of life is where we have to become a little more patient with ourselves. But another part of life is that we have to have boundaries. Uh, and that is so that we can say it's time for Jesus. So I'll leave you with a few thoughts here. And always understand that when I ask questions, it's simply so we can meditate. That's a lot of meditation based on our questions. And here it is. If you wanted to get a hold of, let's say, uh, your priest, and you called in the secretary, because that's the normal way to do that, you call, the secretary answers, says, thanks for the news, you say, I'd like to talk to Father Jones, and the secretary says, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, he's praying right now. Just ponder that one for a moment. What would your response be if the secretary said, I'm sorry, he's not available right now, he's praying. Okay. You call and you want to talk to the priest. Mind you, none of these are emergencies. In other words, your automobile is not hanging on the cliff, so to speak. And you're not in the emergency room. And But you want the priest then because you want the priest then. And secretary says, I'm terribly sorry, but he's in a meeting. What do you say? It's the third one. You call and say you want to talk to the priest. The secretary says, I'm so sorry, but it's his day off, and on his day off, that's his study day. What do you say? And so you see, we always have to look very carefully inside ourselves and recognize a couple of principles of life that's really important. Human beings will always disappoint you. It's because they have limitations, just like you. Clergy are not exempt, you know. Clergy are human beings. They, they weren't dropped out of an ecclesiastical helicopter down onto a church somewhere. They were actually brought up by you. The clergy, you know, were brought up and formed by people like you in a church because they didn't get formation in isolation. And you're the one who is helping teach that little boy how to pray. And now he's your bishop. Wow, amazing. What contribution did I offer? <laughs> well, don't hand him a few dollars so he can buy a new miter. Uh, give him what he really needs, and that's your prayer. Cover him with prayer. That's what he needs. He can take that with him. Can't take his miters. I, I think some bishops would like to, especially, you know, the really fancy ones. But now let's go to the next point and the final point here. Jesus is always available to you. Always. And sometimes when we want people to do things for us in this world, uh, we're kind of checking in with the working class, and I love the working class. That's what I come from, and that is no apology, folks. But many people really want to work with management, and what I have to remind people sometimes is that I'm in sales, not management, uh, but I work for God. And if people have complaints or concerns or fears or anxieties about anything, 
in the world, they have to start there. That's where you start. Try never to say anything to anybody unless you've severely and honestly prayed. Very important. Bishop Polk, who was the Bishop of Fort Worth uh, when I was a, a parish priest in the uh, Diocese of Fort Worth from 89 to 94, when I was elected bishop, and he eventually became one of the co-consecrators at my consecration in Illinois, said to me, remember this. The hardest lesson for me to learn as a bishop was this. You don't have to give everybody an answer right at that moment. And do you remember how it used to be said that if you wrote an, a letter, maybe it was angry, letter, maybe there's something bothering you or whatever, that you write it and you put it in the drawer and then you read it the next day and oftentimes you threw it away. Um, that level has been taken away from us today. People are now emailing and blogging and I don't know all these things out there. And then they realize later on they can't take it back. It's out there. It's bad enough if other people seeing it now. But you see, prayer is different. If you go to God first, he will take care of all those things going on inside of you. And maybe the message that you have will be sweeter, kinder, more compassionate. But in the end, really be Jesus. Sharing Jesus. Now let me leave you with that age-old question you've heard before because I only tell you what I tell myself. <laughs> because I'm in this pilgrimage with you, and that's this. If I were arrested today simply for being a Christian, because that's the word it got around that I was, would my life, my words, and my actions indicate that there was enough against me to have me convicted? Let us pray. Oh Lord, hear the silence of our hearts. Fears, anxieties, judgments, criticism, slander, gossip that aren't really prayers. And so Lord, we offer them up to you because you have told us we're supposed to do that. You said, come unto me, all the travail, and every lane I will refresh you. So, Lord, we take even those things that we think are unworthy of being mentioned to you because we have to acknowledge they're there. And now, Lord, we ask you to transform our hearts even today so we can become more like the person that you created us to be. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. Take it to the Lord in prayer.